friend of Dr. Chaudhry's. They became acquainted a long time ago. He's come to us through Dr. Chaudhry, Dr. Ted Sibic. I'm going to allow you to give your background. So I changed my speech in the last three minutes. <laughs> Based on how everything is evolving here today, um, Taoists call that affinity. That affinity brings into your life what you may need the most, or who needs to cross your path at that particular time. And so in that tenet, I'm going to change what I originally wanted to talk about to something that I think that is on our minds, and that is uh, with death. And in order to do so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and how I got into Chinese medicine, which is kind of esoteric at best here in Western Pennsylvania. It's actually it's not the Mecca, let's put it that way, <laughs> Chinese medicine, and especially where I live in an ultra-conservative town in Leechburg, Population 2,000 and shrinking. Uh, it's not exactly the mecca for Chinese medicine. Um, but, you know, uh, I was blessed to be very sick when I was a baby. And they never expected me to live. And age five, I won't get into all the details because I tell this story and I tell it so often uh, to preface kind of where I'm going in Chinese medicine and why that um, it's kind of boring to me, but I, I want to give you the synopsis, the, the cliff note version, right? Uh, so please don't nod off. Um, so at age five, I entered into a massive asthma attack that lasted five days. Uh, I was hospitalized, and at that particular point, they realized that my heart was probably going to give out. I wasn't going to die necessarily of the asthma attack, but from a heart attack. And at that particular time, a wonderful human being by the name of Dr. Herbert Mansman, uh, who I still am in contact with today, decided that he was going to use an experimental drug on me. And that drug you may have heard of is called Curare. I was the first human being ever to have Curare administrated to me with the idea that it would paralyze my body, which it does to the monkeys in South America, um, which the natives, the indigenous tribes used, and that's where this idea came from, that if we could paralyze a monkey, we could paralyze a human being, thereby giving his heart a rest. And we can put him on mechanical devices long enough that perhaps he can recuperate, because otherwise he is going to die. And so they did, and they overdosed me times five. Um, I died. I was dead, according to their records, 15 minutes. Um, out of that sprang a whole new interest in death and dying. This was written up in, in Lancet, and it was written up in JAMA. Not the dying part, but that Karari works. <laughs> they left out that little detail. But I was pursued by psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and my family for years. What happens on the other side? What happens when you die? Fast forward. I decided that the weakest link after that experience was my physical body. And so I decided to do something about it, but I didn't know why. My mind was strong. My spirit was even stronger after what I experienced. But my body was weak. And so I told my father, the only thing that I want in this world is to study martial arts. He said, well, what? There's not even a martial arts school around here. What are you talking about? I mean, this is, this is early 1960s, some dating myself. Um, at that particular time, martial arts was not taught to children. But I was a very tenacious child, so uh, we found a martial arts teacher. Um, that ended in disaster. I ended up in the hospital for three days in an oxygen tent because I had another asthma attack. So my parents said, you're not doing this. <laughs> you know, this is not a good idea. Don't go down that road. And I said, this is all I want in life. I stumbled into someone who decided to teach me privately martial arts in my home with the deal that I would also learn to meditate. He was a Chan Buddhist. And the martial art that I first studied was Jiu Jitsu. 
And so every day I'd come home from public school and I would change clothes and my instructor would be there to train me. And every day we'd go into the woods and meditate for an hour with 15 minutes of martial arts lessons. Fast forward to the age of 12, had another incident and died again. Two near-death experiences before basically puberty. And this formulated something in my mind. I realized this is bigger than me. And the acts that we sometimes don't think about of servitude and compassion are far more important than what's going on in our lives. So I didn't know what to do. I thought first I was going to be a police officer. I thought that would be a wonderful way because to follow the law, to, to help people in need, to serve and protect, do you remember that? Right? I thought that would be great. And I went, no, I don't want to do that. And my dad said, you know, the only people who really you're going to meet in life are really the bad people. Is that what you really want? And I'm like, well, there's other people that I'm going to meet too. And he said, well, well, I'll think about it. So I decided that I was going to go into computers because everyone told me that I was too weak and frail to basically do anything else. So I went and got a degree in computers. And once I got a job, I started going back to school because I really wanted to go into medicine. And while I was in pre med pit, I took a conference in upstate New York with a gentleman who later became my mentor and my second father. He was a Taoist priest and a 88th generation physician. And so I quit medical school and I dedicated the next 12 years of my life to being his disciple. I'm now an 89th generation Zongyi, which is physician and priest. And so I see people at my clinic with a lot of what you would call very difficult cases all the time. I teach internationally Chinese medicine um, because I was taught in the classical ways from the Zhao and the Han dynasties, which are stuff that you do not hear about in acupuncture colleges today. I teach at acupuncture colleges all over North America um, because of the lineage that was passed down to me. This oral tradition is not available in books. And so I'm now trying to be the educator, the ambassador for Chinese medicine so these things are not lost. My teacher once told me that you must stand on the shoulders of your teachers. In other words, you must improve the system so the system does not die. And that's what I'm trying to do with Chinese medicine. An interesting thing that you may not know about Chinese medicine is there never was segregation at all between the mind, the body, and the spirit. We just consider them different aspects of different communication systems. And we would call them different things, Jing Qi Shen, the three Dung Tians. But they now represent things that we are talking about in modern science. What Dr. Chaudhry was talking about, the gut, the enteric nervous system. And in recent research, what HeartMath is actually doing out in California with the heart actually driving hormonal balances. What we're finding out is the brain is actually more of a receptor and a mediator than it is actually the driving force. And these three Duntians are about communication. They're about synergistic communication of a community of cells in your body that basically have to talk very well together in order for there to be health or wellness. And as the Chinese say, you have to be healthy in order to fulfill your destiny. Your destiny is given to you upon your birth, as well as a very interesting concept that we call Jing. Jing is like grains of sand of time. And you are given so many, and you can do whatever you want with them, anything you want. But understand, you only have so many to use. Now what I try to teach to my students and what I try to teach to my patients, regardless of how much time they have left, because I do see a lot of terminally ill patients, phase three, phase four cancer, uh, people that have seven, eight, nine lesions on their spine and MS, people that are paralyzed, um, people with uh, bipolar, paranoid schizophrenia, 
the worst of the worst is a lot of women. Basically, when nobody else can help them, they get sent to me. And I have international clientele. So what I tell them is, regardless, you have X amount of Jing left. And this is a good question for all of you. What do you want to do with that time? What do you want to do with that time? What do you want to invest that jing into? Because I can tell you, life is very precious. Life is very precious. And we never just start to think about that until something goes wrong with the mechanics. We start to think about our own mortality. We start to think about what in fact did we or did we not do? And when I see a lot, and this question was asked earlier, I see a lot of what life becomes for a lot of people, young or old, when they become sick, is they run from doctor to doctor, appointment to appointment. Various specialties, um, they go to special places, Case Western, they go to Mayo Clinic, they're always looking for very specialized answers. The problem in with specialized is that no one communicates. Health is about communication. Now that is whether it's inside your body or healthy relationships outside your body. It's always about the integrative of communication. How well you can communicate with your mind and are you at peace with your mind and thereby peace within your body. And so I try to get people to think about how they can have peace in their life regardless of their pathology. And that's a different approach. It's a very different way of looking at health. It's about walking in center, as we like to call, walking in peace while you do your servitude to humanity. And that's what, it, what actually interested me in coming here, because I see such a community of the sisters willing to go out of their own way, of their own I would say pathology or injuries or pain or whatever, and to allow the cogs of the community to actually work together. Because everyone has something to give. Everybody has something to contribute. And part of your job is to figure that out and to be able to give that back to community and servitude so that it outlives you. That's what we call lineage in Chinese medicine. What am I going to leave behind? Am I going to leave behind a wake of peace? Or am I going to leave behind a wake of disorder? And so when I look at the sisters, and I came here to visit with Dr. Chaudhry, and we got to do some rounds and talk to some patients, and I got to meet some of the staff, I told him that I wanted to become involved in the project that he was doing today. Because I see community, this outreach, and then further realizing of what they do on the outside to people that I never knew about. I grew up in Leechburg. I didn't know that all this was going on. And I'm sure a lot of other people don't know what's going on. So I figured that this is worthwhile to get involved in, to educate people, to communicate with people to what is really happening here, to allow people to know through this communication of what's available to them, what specialties do each person has to offer and their different interests in life, manifesting their destiny for the benefit of others. This to me is interesting work. It's interesting work in my private practice, but I'm also seeing more and more people becoming interested outside of their scope of practice. And this lends to the question of where are we going in the 21st century or the 22nd century? Where is healthcare going? Where is care going? Not just health care, where is care going? And to me, I have two different tracks of education that I offer. Because I seen the need 10 years ago for this to happen. The one track is where I have a lot of physicians and nurses and chiropractors and orthopedics and DOs and uh, a lot of healthcare professionals that are looking to get into something more than their original scope of practice. They're realizing that there's an energy that occurs within the human body 
that is not yet tangible. And that's the energy that the Chinese call qi. Qi is what I call the great communicator. It allows everything else to talk. And so some physicians are going for their acupuncture license. And some chiropractors are going for their acupuncture license. I even have lawyers coming in because they realize there's something more that they can offer. The idea is to offer them an educational system that's going to lead with a grounded language that we can all talk to each other regardless of our profession. And that's one track. The other track that I see is people who are already realizing from a psychological, from a psychosocial, from a neurological perspective that there's something greater. There is a divine. There's a God. There's a divinity. There's a universal life force. So many words, so many times, so many different ways to describe it. And they want to understand how human emotions and humanistic experience can translate into something greater into their practice. And so we teach them about the integration of mind. And the integration of mind is that which the enteric nervous system, the heart, and the brain integrate into our emotional content. Our emotional content is the summation of our experiences in life. And what that actually means to us is if we were going to die tomorrow. So I have, a student, uh, I have a saying that I say to my students. I says, live your life that this day, this moment, using these grains of jing, like you're going to die at the end of the day. And in the morning, resurrect and lead your life like you have one more day to live. Live presently, live mindfully, live in the moment, Speak well. And the other tenet of formless Taoism is to learn to walk in this world in a grounded fashion without judgment. Quit being so harsh. Because at the end of the day, folks, humanistic judgment doesn't mean that much. Everything that we judge and we see as black and white in the true spiritual realms does not matter. And people argue and get into fights about their opinions all the time. In the essence of dying, it's really about letting go. And if you can start to let go now, you're going to be further ahead of the game. There's a saying that my friend Wayne Dyer says, and he says, I've never seen anybody in a funeral procession carrying a U-Haul. <laughs> right? And, and, and it's good, because we work so much for the possessions in life, to, for the acquisitions. And a lot of times we carry with us the acquisitions of our emotional content. And that plays in our mind and consumes our jing. When in fact, what service does it really provide? Most often, your mind can be elsewhere, and you're missing the moment with your children, or your family, or a dying parent. That, to me, is what life is about. To be present and to take it all in. Soak it in like a sponge, because it, nothing's guaranteed tomorrow. I know this. I've been through this. I can speak with it from experience. And I think that no matter what our education says to us, we really can't speak of something until we have the experience of it. One of the things that I wanted to do is to give people an authentic experience. And through that, then they know it can be true. An authentic experience is something that you take in and you feel, not something you read in a book. You can't get wet with the world word water, as Ellen Watts said, right? You have to feel, that's the humanistic experience. You have to feel in order to know you're human. And so the things that we feel, good, bad, or indifferent, are the things that are real to us and they're the truth. And to give people that kind of sentiment, that kind of ability to make a connection. 
And that's why the Chinese work so much on this concept of qi, because it connects the physical world with the spiritual world. And it allows us to have a dialogue, and this is what fascinated me about Chinese medicine, the way that it was originally taught, is there was a method, there was a way to train the mind to have dialogue and communication between the physical Jing body and that which we call spirit or Shen. To me, there had to be a connection. There had to be a way of allowing healthcare to connect those two. And my lineage goes back almost 7,000 years. People haven't changed. People are still the same. We still have the same emotions. We still have stress. It's just different. The emotional content that we carry around and our physical pathology all have to have good communication so that we can solve these issues. That doesn't mean they always go away, but you can have a deeper understanding and thereby perhaps have a deeper connection with God or the divine or whatever, however you want to phrase it. Having that communication, having that dialogue daily is what's important and allowing ourselves to take that into consideration in the next century of healthcare. To integrate the true human being is what we really need to be looking for, regardless of how it is done. If it's through specialization or whatever, let's all talk and communicate with each other. Let's all continue the dialogue and get integrated. But we keep creating different ways to separate. You know, uh, the Tao Te Ching talks about, in, in the pursuit of knowledge, it is limitless. In the pursuit of Tao or God, it is about stripping away, and then in the words of David Thoreau, simplify, simplify, simplify. <clears throat> simplify your life so that you can appreciate the simplicity of that which really matters. Thank you.